Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Six Steps to Effective ICS Threat Hunting, sponsored by Dragos. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Tim Conway, Technical Director, ICS and SCADA programs at SANS, and he will be moderating today's webcast. Oh, he's also a SANS certified instructor. And then we also have Mark Seitz, Industrial Hunter, and Dan Gunter, Director, Research and Development, both at Dragos Threat Operations Center. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Tim. Thank you very much, Carol. And good morning, afternoon to those who are joined on the call. I've been looking through the list of uh, almost a couple hundred people joined here and we have a good representation from around the world. So um, for some of you, this is evening hours and for some of you, it's, it's very, very early. So again, thanks for joining. Um, in your GoToMeeting, you have an option for a chat window and you have an option for questions. Um, please make use of those. This webcast is gonna be a little bit different. Um, all of us on the webcast have done a number of webcasts through SANS, and they generally kind of format, walk through a um, uh, passing of the baton model where somebody kind of sets the stage and walks through and then passes the baton to another presenter and then to another presenter, and we handle questions at the end. Um, working with uh, these two great presenters at, at Dragos, uh, we definitely want this to be more of a discussion. We're going to run this whole webcast that way. And we're going to work through kind of three different topic areas. So uh, as questions occur to you, please uh, send them through, and I'll try to manage our time and your questions to get uh, everything you're hoping to get answered addressed. Um, with that, the uh, organization, I think uh, almost everybody on this call should be very, very familiar with Dragos, but um, with a company as large as, as it's grown to, I would like to just ask um, Dan and Mark to take a couple of minutes to tell us about their particular background and focus areas before we jump into these uh, discussion topics. So um, with that, I'll start with, uh, with Dan, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So my name is Dan Gunner. As Tim mentioned, I work for Dragos. Um, as the title shows, I'm the Director of Research and Development. Um, so Dragos is primarily a uh, product-based company, so we produce a, you know, a product for passive network monitoring in industrial environments. My role specifically is I lead the R&D efforts at Dragos, so everything from control system research on how, you know, buying and taking apart large control systems to figure out how they work, um, to the detection engineering piece of figuring out what an asset owner cares about, and then also how you tie that to um, detections uh, for different types of threat actors, what they might do in the environment. Prior to R&D at Dragos, I was an analyst, and so I went out um, with asset owners, did everything from red teaming to threat hunting to incident response, the whole gambit of um, activities. Um, Prior to Dragos, came from a DOD background, so was Air Force for a few years. I worked for the Air Force CERT, um, doing global response for the Air Force, and also um, working with Cybercom on a few of the uh, um, Cybercom mission areas. So with that, I will kick over to Mark to talk about himself a little bit. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, so, yep, Mark Seitz, part of the, the Threat Operations Center here. And uh, being an industrial hunter, threat analyst kind of all mixed together, I have uh, essentially a background across almost every ICS vertical at this point, just from a uh, go to the network, assess what's going on, and then doing a variety of services on top of that, whether it be some sort of vulnerability assessment, uh, whether it be a you know, pure, pure threat hunt. Um, it's really taking those ideas and concepts that we're familiar with, um, and, and where I like to focus on that is the how do we automate, how do we make ourselves more efficient, how do we take the, you know, what we, what we find out in the field and make it actionable for everybody else. So uh, I've spent the better part of two years focusing on that here at Dragos and kind of having the full flexibility to go across to electric, to food, uh, food and beverage, um, to oil and gas, you know, all, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of verticals there. So um, yeah, that's a, a brief introduction there. Uh, Tim, back over to you. Awesome, thank you very much. I thought it was important to the, uh, the audience just 
to kind of walk through background so you can frame your questions and, and more importantly than anything else as you're dialing into these types of webcasts to know um, for this particular one, there's, there's no one on here with a sales background or with a sales function or purpose. So um, definitely come with your technical questions as you're looking at building out threat hunting capabilities or teams or looking at tools. Um, definitely try to ask those questions here so we can get them addressed and answered. As we were trying to think about what might be fun, how to, how to build this um, webcast and walk through some topics, um, two things came, came up immediately, one of them being um, some papers that, uh, that both of these gentlemen have, have worked on, um, submitted through SANS and through the reading room, and they've been uh, highly, highly talked about, downloaded, pursued. So uh, we thought trying to capture what's covered in those two, web, uh, two, two white papers um, would be of interest to the people on the phone. And a second topic, uh, we're, we're kind of looking for thoughts and framing around a piece that has not been written up yet in a paper, and uh, we'll talk about that towards the end of this, this webcast. But the first paper in the, uh, in, in the reading room really focuses on kind of a need for a formal and common understanding of effective threat hunting as a variety of different vendors or uh, law enforcement intelligence organizations or kind of uh, countrywide certs are using, using language and maybe not in consistent ways and um, setting kind of expectations of, of uh, applicability of some of the indicators that they're identifying. We really wanted to talk about a paper that has been written by, um, by both of our presenters in, in really an effort to try to pursue something better. So there's a common understanding across the industry, a common way of thinking about this and, the, and really getting to a point where the approach that is being talked about has some level of rigor in it and uh, you can have faith and confidence in what somebody is saying if they followed that, uh, that process. Second paper we're gonna talk about is, so if you think of the first one more as a scientific or a research type of paper, the second paper more of an applied, um, kind of a practical approach for conducting cyber threat hunts. Um, we'll spend a good portion of the webcast talking about those two papers that exist. Um, for anybody who has downloaded them, read them, if you have questions that are outstanding, please submit them. We'll get them asked while we're covering each one of those papers. And the third is really a paper that I believe needs to be written. Um, I'm hoping to pursue it with, uh, with both of these gentlemen and other contributors if they're interested, focusing on kind of the tools and techniques that are used um, by various asset owners and operators of different levels of maturity. There's not a one size fits all approach here. Um, everybody doesn't have the same size problem nor the same size budgets or the same size of a team with, with similar capabilities. So there's not just one right way to do this, um, really kind of uh, trying to meet people where they're at and help them take the next step in, the, in a direction of being able to fight this battle better. Um, we'll talk about that as we close. Um, to begin with, we're gonna start with this first paper, which uh, shown on the screen here is kind of more of the scientific academic um, pursuit of something better here, the, uh, the hunting with rigor, um, the URL is listed on the screen. All these slides will be available at the end. But uh, right, right out the bat, um, as, as, you're, as you're reading this paper, you'll find references to a couple of different types of threat hunting. So threat focused and an environmental hunt. Um, along the line here, most of this is going to be discussion between myself and the other two panel members. But in some cases, we've tried to add one or two slides total to just kind of have on screen a, a clear message that, uh, that's being communicated. But um, if we can begin, uh, Dan or Mark, if either one of you can begin talking about the definition of, of how you kind of present the two different types of threat hunt um, that are presented in this paper and, and how you distinguish between the two of them. Yeah, certainly. And so where, where really this paper originated from um, was over the past two years, what we've done, what Mark and I have done together at Dragos um, and how we've approached threat hunts. Um, and so when we wrote this paper, a lot of the original genesis was realizing that industrial environments, um, you know, you do have the whole physics on the other side of the computer. You have the whole consequence um, side of the control system. Um, you know, a lot of control systems are computers that are just driving parts of that process. And so when you approach them to threat hunt um, at the time, and Mark might chime in in a, in a second on this, 
we really saw two ways, or I saw two ways you could approach threat hunting in an industrial environment or in industrial settings. The first being the environment focus, so taking a technology focus. So I'm going to plan a threat hunt around how I know or my understanding of how Emerson Innovation, how Honeywell Experion, pick your control system of how that looks. And what I want to do in this threat hunt is kind of figure out what does my terrain look like? Um, a lot of times, particularly when you're talking about anomalies, but even threat detection, it kind of gets to this question of what's normal. And if you don't know what your plant looks like, if you don't know the expected communications between the industrial products, um, you can't really define what normal is um, to even get anomalies or to get threat detection off of. And so for an environmental focused threat hunt, really the idea that we had with this is you're focusing on a particular product or maybe even a part, if you're in a refinery, a part of the refining process or whatever process you're in, picking a part of that. With this, this is where as a defender, you can capitalize on the home field advantage, right? Because you can know your plant better than the attacker um, and just knowing that you're going to have a better opportunity to know, again, what that normal versus weird looks like. On the flip side, you might focus a hunt on the threat focus. And so it is threat hunting. Um, but on this side, we're taking threat actor TTPs. So here at Dragos, we spend a lot of time both on our Intel team, um, our engineering team and the R&D team on looking at threat actor TTPs. You know, how does nation state X or nation state Y, you know, how are they targeting targeting industrial networks? What does it look like? And um, how can I essentially look for that? Um, with this, one of the really genesis on this paper too, where Mark and I started was, there's a lot of good threat hunting resources out there. A lot start with hypothesis generation. And this is really taking threat hunting, trying to take back the practice of threat hunting one step to say, Yes, hypothesis um, generation is important, but really you should take a step back and say, okay, within the context of my environment in the industrial network, you know, what am I, what am I focusing that set of hypotheses on? Um, you know, otherwise you just start with a hunt where it's like I'm going to go look for PS exec, um, which is good, but you know, you kind of want more of that why there, and we'll cover that a little later. Um, but with Thread Focus too, this is where you can also differentiate TTPs. So when you talk about um, commonly shared open source tools that we know are being used against industrial environments, things like Mimi Cats, Cobalt Strike, those type of tools, um, with this hunt, you can also begin to understand how the TTPs differentiate to say, hey, this looks like group activity group X versus activity group Y based on how I know they use tools or how I know they use different techniques in the environment. Um, so this is all to say that when we split down to this, we kind of view the two types of hunting when we wrote this paper as being the, either you're focused on that technology, how the control system works, or you're focused on that TTP side of let me go look for, you know, nation state X or group wise TTPs. Yeah, and one thing I just I want to add on top of that, where this is where this is important from a definition perspective, is we've seen a lot of frustration even from our own team, or just when we go to perform you know threat hunts in, inside of these environments, we're, we'll be talking to other threat hunters or other threat hunt programs, and there's a frustration of like we don't know what the metrics look like, we don't necessarily know what we're looking for, we've just been given this sort of you know the, the directive of well we need to do threat hunting, right? Without kind of breaking down the why or the, the how to get there. And essentially going straight into, into the, the threat side, the, the, the TTPs, rather than what is actually here, right? What is on my network? How do I how do I defend what's here? Do I do I know what I'm actually looking at? Um, and again, you're gonna have a lot of frustration if you kind of jump straight into the threat side without understanding where things are at. You need to have a lay of the land first, um, and, and being able to do that should should produce a lot better results uh, down the road. So I just want to add that comment there for sure. That's awesome. Um, just watching some of the questions come through. So uh, um, knowing all range of, of people are, are joining this and looking at kind of what, where they're going to go next, kind of the next step that they're going to march down the path of and building their uh, threat hunting um, programs. 
um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to try to spell out some acronyms. So the first question that's come through is kind of on the lines of, uh, can you explain what a TTP is? We've heard it a bunch of times already. Um, so the tactics, techniques, and procedures. And if we, if we walk down a path of uh, just the two things that we're looking at here from a, a type of threat hunt from an environment or a threat focused, um, can you guys, from your time out in the field, from your time in doing this work and time working with customers, would you categorize kind of what uh, approach you're seeing more of a environment focused threat hunting or a threat focused hunt and you know why you would say one would be more successful for an organization versus another right so yeah typically from the fields we've seen you know, the threat hunt programs just jump right into the um essentially we're kind of, kind of looking at like why why people are jumping into it right you see the the, the media kind of throws out the you know, someone's attacking the power grid or this facility was taken down. And we've seen that kind of propel threat hunt programs into existence or even forward from what they're currently at into, well, we need to go find that, find whatever that was. Right? And typically that's, that's meant indicator sheets that that's available or, or even going, going so far as to say, what are the behaviors we'll be looking for? And ultimately, just trying to run those things in your environment, that's where we've seen the frustration of, great, we're, we're going to look for this kind of behavior. We're looking for for these procedures that, um, you know, whatever activity group is using, and then they kind of fall flat with that because they don't know where the, where their data is at. They don't know if they can actually go access anything, who owns what kind of systems, and they're really going through that for the, through the first time. So ultimately, you know, to, to answer that question more directly, we see folks try and go for more of the threat side. It's, it's certainly much more flashy. It's what management cares more about from a, is this going to cause downtime? What are the capabilities of, of whoever is acting maliciously? But ultimately, groups that are going to be focused more on the environment first have way better answers to bring forward to their management when they say, we see, we've seen this kind of behavior. It goes over, um, you know, SMB, so, uh, you know, some, some sort of uh, file movement. But if you don't have those protocols, you would be okay. Um, it, but again, that's coming from knowledge of the environment, understanding what systems and, and how they communicate with one another to better inform the threat focus. So... A lot of programs focusing uh, or trying to get to the threat side without necessarily factoring in what's on my environment first and going down that route. That's yeah, and I'll, I'll oh, sorry, Tim. I'll chime in on that and say too for threat focus, um, like the threat intel source that you use is really important, right? Because when you're when you're talking about starting with TTPs, um, you know you're starting with what you think the group you're looking for is doing, right? And so. Part of this paper too, and the rigor part of the paper is really, you know, during a threat hunt, you might randomly find, um, you might randomly find an attacker in your network. Um, but if you're doing a TTP or a, you know, a TTP focused threat hunt and your threat intel isn't leading you to the right data sources or to do the right analysis, um, you know, you're not, you might not be successful. So, you know, it's important to point out with threat focus, there is that threat intel element that's really important. And while, while uh, you're there, there's, I can say the, uh, I wish this was more of a town hall with open conversation and mics, but that, that has a whole bunch of other problems that go with it. Um, the level of questions that we're getting, I can tell you um, from a time perspective, we'll have to grab all of these and get them to the two presenters and uh, they can follow up offline. But where we're talking about topics where these fit, can you provide some some uh, thoughts on your favorite threat intel feed? So specifically, if, if threat focused has a lot to do with how good, how accurate, how current uh, the relevance of your TTPs and uh, the, the intel feeds that you're getting, what are um, some that you would mention that you would recommend people go and pursue? So we're obviously biased because um, that's one of the uh, <laughs> provided. I mean, Dragos, right, we do, I mean, we have a threat intel team and that's really our di differentiator for Dragos on the market. So, um, you know, we're biased to ours. Um, I'll let Mark, since he's, uh, um, you know, been on more hunts recently, talk through some of the other resources he might have used. Yeah, so it, 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 for me, it's less about a single single resource or a single company that's doing something, looking more at the quality of the information that you're given. So yes, a lot of them are going to have indicator sweeps, but really when I, when I start dissecting out, you know, what other resources are out there or as a team we're kind of looking for, for things is, 
is it giving me enough information to sort of abstract away from specific indicators so I can make some sort of behaviors out of it, right? That's where Biggest Intel, our Intel team is going to be able to do that for us. We can kind of have a collaborative nature. And ultimately, we've put a lot of open source uh, information out there where you can actually abstract some of that um, sort of material in there and make, make those behaviors. So really, what it's, it's more about the process for reviewing what you're seeing and, and trying to figure out, is it worth my time to now pursue whatever was, whatever was given to me in a blog post or some sort of you know, Twitter feed or whatever else it is, assessing what kind of hypotheses can I create out of this and then go from there. Um, ultimately, Google searching gets, a, gets us a decent way just from you know, looking at what's out there. Uh, certainly a lot of good, a lot of good Twitter threads um, from just really knowledgeable people and you just kind of start picking apart the information. Um, so yeah, more of a more of a methodology for looking at what you're what you're getting. Because I think companies, um, you know, I, I think they they can kind of go up or down on is it really good Intel or is it something that's going to kind of fall flat. I think that's a little bit of the nature of that. So it's just assessing what you're given and not relying on just one source of information or anything. And we see too. I mean, we see um, you know if if companies don't have a threat Intel program. Um, you know, if they have a good threat intel program, we see a lot that comes out of that. If they don't have one, even, I mean, using open source reporting um, can be helpful, right? So if you're in mining, right, you might look at the groups that generally attack, um, you know, mining. And there's a lot of open source material around there, too, that you can build that level of threat intel around without having to, um, you know, go with a vendor solution that's open um, on the market. So... I'd encourage Tim on your question too that um, there's certainly a lot of information out there um, that you can kind of base these on top of. Great. Um, a couple just follow-ups on the the work that uh, Dragos does from uh, uh, IOC. There, there. I know there are some reports that you make available for free. Um, I know you also have kind of a an Intel feed that you sell. Um, uh, can you just mention the ones that you have for free, uh, free resources that people can go grab or by registering with uh, with your organization? There are questions specifically for ICS-related IOCs and where people can get those feeds so they can add them in to their existing tool sets. I'm actually yep. uh, not. So I, I, Mark, you got it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, again, I'm dropping a little bit more towards the sales side or whatever. But, um, you know, we, so we, we do have a commercial um, Intel feed. It's not a traditional Intel feed of just, you know, run these IOCs through. It's certainly something that we provide, but it's much more about the context. It's giving, you know, here's why this was fear, uncertainty, doubt from the from the media. Here's what you know what our expert intel analysts think about what's going on. So those are the reports that we're we're given. I would say a resource that no one has to go and pay for is just going to the Dragos website. Uh, actually, just went through our redesign. Our, our marketing team did a fantastic job. Um, and so just going to the resource page there. All of our white papers. Um, our activity group cards are on there. Uh, as specifically noting on the activity group cards, if you get to that section, looking at the capabilities um, that are there, right? It kind of lists up some of the tools that activity groups are working with. Um, and if you want to build kind of profiles off that into your own tool sets or whatever else it is to kind of look for those, or at least to get, uh, get an idea of what the coverage is, that's all on our website. So I would definitely, definitely encourage people to go look for that. And if there's, um, if there's a need for, for anything beyond that, uh, yeah, just just reach out uh, to anybody on the Intel team, on the sales team, anything like that. We'll get you to the right place. That's great. And also with that, definitely. Too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Oh no, sorry with that too. The uh, I'd also encourage like the crash override report, the Trisis report. Um, you know, any of the reports that have put, been put out. I know both Dragos and Sands um, have uh, pretty good technical reports um, with things that you can action off of during a hunt. So. Tim, to your question earlier, I'd also say the answer would be um, some of the big recent events that uh, both Sands and Dragos mm -hmm. have, um, you know, pretty extensively done good uh, technical reports on. Great. Yeah, and I would I would recommend the activity group. I look at those as like uh, baseball player cards for the uh, the various activity groups that are out there um, with some of the, uh, the stats and some of the information that you would need to know as you're starting to conduct your threat focused hunts. Um, just before we move off of this topic and into next paper, um, so uh, reposition your questions to the uh, the studio audience in regards to uh, more applied and conducting threat hunts as we as we start moving into that topic. But to summarize some of what we covered here, so in a normal world with uh, with 
um, good employee retention and good employee training and a, a robust uh, threat hunting program. This this kind of capitalize on home field advantage, and you should certainly know your environment better than the adversary. And adversary doing activity in your environment should uh, should be relatively easy to highlight. But in many many organizations where employees are coming and going, um, various levels of capabilities, um, everybody kind of has experience with different tool sets. You end up in this strange model where adversaries are in environments, in some cases, longer than the employees who support them or manage them. Um, so if that's your case, uh, you would tend to move more towards a threat-focused approach if uh, you're still kind of normalizing and trying to gain an inventory down at your OT levels and, and uh, really truly understand that environment so you can know what normal looks like. Um, is that sort of in line with, uh, with uh, the two different types of hunt? Yeah, that's exactly it. And it, it goes down to, you know, you can do a lot of great things with baselines and with anomaly detection. But if your baselines in, of your anomalies are set on, in a contested environment, um, you know, that, that you know, the attacker's normal is built into your normal if, sure. you know, your environment's <laughs> okay. baseline. So that's where you do really need to get to the threat focused, um, you know, beyond just um, anomaly detection in that case. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that, that kind of moves towards, there's, a, there's an interesting quote in that paper where it's on uh, Newton's theory that every action kind of has a equal reaction. This, an adversary working in an environment will leave behind elements that would aid kind of a threat hunter. Um, there's two, two ways of thinking about that. One is if you don't know the environment, the adversary actions now look normal to you. And uh, the secondary piece is if you do know the environment and the adversary's actions stick out, then when you begin operating in that space, um, it becomes apparent to the adversary that there's somebody who's trying to counter their activity. So that, uh, that, that theory applies both directions. So it, it becomes more of a chess game in, in a well-defended environment as well as a well-targeted environment. Um, one piece before we exit this, um, this paper, truly, it's uh, rigor is in the title, and we haven't mentioned the word once. So, and I think it is the, probably the more important uh, framework of the paper is can you give me just uh, a couple of minutes on what you consider something of a mid-level to higher level rigor, meaning a company who has nothing currently and they're trying to develop a threat program or they haven't really considered it, but they're issued an alert from their, uh, their sector specific agency telling them there's been targeting to your sector. Here are the uh, adversary TTPs and they go look in a small subset or they go look in kind of their IT environment for certain adversary TTPs or they, they, they're looking for the wrong stuff in the wrong uh, areas of their space and they come to the conclusion that um, we don't have any active infections. It's the, it's the model of you're not actively monitoring, but you can quickly determine that you're not infected. Um, that's really where this word rigor comes. So if you could give me a couple of minutes on, uh, on what you would consider a, in a good enough level of rigor before you can make some conclusions. Right. So, and you know, that's good because with rigor, it really, um, our thoughts are, it comes down to coverage, right? So if you're, if you're out threat hunting in a refinery, right, you have the different parts of the process, um, the different networks. If you're in a Honeywell environment, you're talking about uh, communities, which are basically um, different active directory domains that uh, make up a Honeywell refining um, environment. And so when you talk about rigor, um, you might say, hey, let's start with the community that's our op center, right? Let's look at our engineering workstations, our HMIs, the areas where, you know, we saw in Ukraine in 2015 uh, and in 2016, the parts that were targeted there. So the areas that you kind of expect um, either the attacker to be or you expect more consequence to be if it's taken down um, or if you lose a... Uh, um, access or view in that area. Um, not all areas of the refinery are as important, um, you know, and so, right, so if you do a coverage, um, it won't necessarily be, um, it won't necessarily be representative of importance starting out, but you can at least say, hey, you know, let me start with just hunting on engineering workstations for TTPs that I see there. Um, that's one kind of rigor approach you can say of how much of the process inside my fence line and even the dependencies coming into the refinery, right? You can't refine oil without certain dependencies coming in. So 
You might also threat hunt on the um, dependencies that come into there. Um, on the Intel side, you can do the same deal, right? So if you do starter, you have an Intel program going, you can say, okay, these are the known TTP groups that we have in the paper walks through this a bit on uh, some of the, how we saw to even automate some of that to say, I'm going to go write a playbook, a hunting playbook, which is the steps um, that I'm doing to prove out the hypothesis. And ideally that playbook maps up with, these are the known TTPs of the, um, you know, the known tactics of the group I'm looking at. And you can measure the coverage there to say, okay, you know, 80% of known TTPs for this activity group, um, I should have covered with this step. Um, so to your point, Tim, kind of that, the combination of coverage and then saying like, hey, I'm looking for PS exec for Mimi Cats for, you know, the crash override malware used in 2016. Um, you only know so much, but you can somewhat quantify um, at least coverage on what you know and you're inside your fence. That's great. Um, I would definitely encourage anybody who's looking for more uh, information on uh, specifically types of collection, the different data sources, and um, understanding you know, how, how you can get to a level of some acceptable level of rigor to be able to draw conclusions and have some, some uh, confidence in the conclusions you're coming to. Um, this first paper, I had sent out the URL to everybody in the entire audience via chat for the first paper, and uh, we will move on to the second paper. And if you're um, out there looking at the screens that aren't changing much, don't be panicked. Um, again, we only have a couple of slides. We wanted this to be really more of a discussion and an opportunity to get your questions answered more than uh, a set of 40 or 50 slides that we were going to march through. So if the screen looks frozen on your end for long periods of time, it's not because you have a technical problem. Um, moving on. So we're, we're about halfway through, and we want to spend some time on this, uh, this second paper, which is really kind of the applied component. So the a practical model for conducting a cyber threat. And I'd sent out this uh, URL to the entire, entire chat group. So if you haven't received this paper, you can go um, find it currently. Um, this slide, we'll just kind of leave up here until we get to our last topic. But as this paper walks through kind of this six phase, um, six step model uh, for kind of the applied practitioners out there who are going to go out and build programs and run active threat hunts in their uh, environments. The paper kind of walks through these steps and other models that exist. And um, just to start the conversation, um, I'll have the, the traditional asset owner and operator skepticism hat on first, which is every time there's a new model that comes out, um, some of the first questions that will appear are, why, why do we need another model? Um, and it's, it's generally fed by questions that'll say, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. How, how did people used to do this? And I think that's an area where um, I thought it was important to have both of the presenters kind of walk through their backgrounds of doing this type of work for a while and doing this type of work in a variety of different sectors. And over time, coming to the conclusion that there was a lack of consistency, there was a need for some type of uh, approach um, seeing what some organizations were doing and seeing gaps and uh, having lessons learned and then really driving towards, we believe this type of model and this type of purpose, or I'm sorry, this type of uh, approach is, is really um, valuable for organizations to pursue. And if, uh, if you guys can walk through kind of those general questions that I know will come up in a number of the audience members' minds and participants of why did we need the model? Uh, how did how did people used to do it, and how does this approach help? So um, to Dan and Mark, I'll let you guys fight over who gets to talk first. But if you could walk through uh, the purpose and the benefit of this, yeah, certainly. And I, I think it, I think it makes sense to even step one, you know, go one one step back here and go, why did we write the paper in the first place? So when we were looking at, you know, taking taking Dragos' threat hunting program, you know, from where it was at to the next level trying to look at any other information, were there any, any other companies that are doing that right or models that we can kind of absorb and use into our own practice, it was tough, right? Looking at the OT space going, is there is there something that really understands the complexities of these systems, the you know the importance of these critical processes continuing to run? Ultimately, we got very discouraged because a lot of the models that we ended up looking at ended in, now you have to buy our product. In order to really do this well, you have to, you know, you have to spend an extra amount of dollars. So, 
well, that doesn't really help the analysts at the end of the day. So for the folks that we were working with and even for ourselves, we wanted to be able to have a reputable and scalable process that leads from hunting to having that automation footprint at the end of the day. Um, at least at least efficiency, at least trying to get there. Um, so what we put together is a six step process. And really when you when you read it and, and we kind of talk about these things, they really end up just being uh, very, very conversational, very discussional between the teams and the stakeholders that need to be involved with uh, with this. So um, I think the biggest thing, I'll just say up front, this does not end in having to buy anything uh, from Dragos. This is this is complete, I mean, just use it for whatever threatening purposes you need to. What it should elicit is a lot of questions about your organization. A lot of times when we see, um, you know, see adopters of this in the organization are asking like, Okay, so my my management has asked me to threat hunt. My question should be, what are we, what for what purpose? Right, we're going to look for zeno time activity as an activity group. We are going to um, understand our system complexities. We're going to look at you know our catalytic cracking unit. Like what what's that, what networking you know helps support that process? I'm kind of going down these steps. So that's the kind of the the, per, the I guess where the model came from. And the purpose being to start up uh, an organization, start a program, or take it from where it's at, make it more efficient, and um, you know, really get into that automation at the end. If you have technologies that you can use, that's where we want to start leveraging those tools and technologies to really get to the, the next level there. So that's kind of the um, at least the background of that. Uh, so Tim, I'll flip it back over over to you. Um, unless you want to go deep dive in, into each step here, or or at least uh, do a high level, I guess. Sure. Yeah, I I think in each one of these, it's everybody listening on the phone. Again, this isn't uh, in in no case, and it, it's the third paper that hasn't been written as well in regards to tools, uh, techniques, approaches. Um, everybody is is at a different place. There's no one size fits all, and this this model is really kind of trying to meet organizations where they are. So the the business purpose and driving business objectives. Um, they, an organization may have a key business objective for a critical asset, and then that's going to drive them into their scope where they're going to develop a program that is specific to that part of their environment. Um, and as they add more resources, add more capabilities, this is a continuous uh, review of um, did they find value in what they did previously with a very small defined scope at a facility? And it's something that they want to expand and add to their teams and continue to fund or uh, do other business objectives and uh, other areas of the business require that funding so they can't. Um, I think these are areas where this has to be viewed by each organization to kind of walk through each one of these elements and identify kind of where they are and how they're going to scope. Um, I, from my perspective, I think the purpose and scope are the two most important components. And um, a number of people need to be def involved at the organization in defining and setting those, and then everything else will come. Um, in in this paper, there's a, there's a number of other models that are referenced from the uh, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain to the additional um, SANS kind of stage one, stage two elements of that kill chain where an industrial control system component stage two was added to the existing Lockheed Martin kill chain to kind of add that. Um, that understanding that a full comprom uh, compromise in the traditional kill chain on on the IT OT networks to then transition into a OT side would uh, require additional actions in an entire additional um, stage. But uh, from a threat hunting perspective, the same thing applies. Kind of the scope of where you're looking, the scope of what you're um, trying to identify. Um, you kind of look across a number of these models. One that's uh, referenced highly and uh, especially in this community is the diamond model um, and again just as a as a way to dive in more on this purpose and scope discussion if if you look at kind of the diamond model and the the four uh, vertices of that the adversary the victim the capability and the infrastructure vertices so from an asset owner and operator perspective um, if i'm looking to task resources so technology training um, workforce people in our environment and determine a scope there's there's some discussion in my mind of how much effort in a developing program for example do i put on the adversary and victim vertices and i look at these four vertices as not being in balance as uh from an asset owner and operator if i look to those two that focus on kind of the intent of an attack 
as an asset owner and operator, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, focusing resources on the infrastructure and capability vertices that could, it's something that I'm directly responsible for, something that I directly influence and I need to react to versus the uh, adversary and victim that is more geopolitical targeting and the, uh, the intent. Um, can you talk just how that comes in when people are defining their purpose and scope where you see asset owners and operators focusing versus maybe law enforcement and intelligence and how those two should kind of lean on each other? Yeah, uh, so so really that, that gets into where that, that purpose comes into play. And I think this is really important when we hear a lot of organizations uh, from, from analysts and from practitioners that are getting the just go threat hunt, right? They hear about something in the news and it's just, you'll go look at that stuff. But really breaking it down, uh, not, not too terribly much, but say, this is the purpose. You know, let's say Dragos puts out a report about Xenotime, as we have a lot of, a lot of open source research about that right now. Um, here's a, you know, business objective, the purpose being, I want to understand if this activity is currently happening in my environment. Um, you know, adding on to some other things about, I want to understand how Xenotime could potentially get in or how they would maybe adapt, uh, you know, their current attacks to, to our system specifically. That, I mean, lock that down as, a, as an actual purpose and objective, um, and then you kind of go from there. Uh, you know, moving through from the stakeholder perspective of, yes, we, we want to look at all 400 facilities that we have, or we're just looking at the OT networks or the, you know, the IT networks from the stage one side. Um, so I, I think to, to your point there, the threat intelligence side, where you're looking at on the diamond model from what, what attacks are actually out there, making sure that the, the people that are asking for the threat hunt, the ones that are pushing forward, have a very clear purpose, a clear objective of we want to find this activity. And, and ultimately, the, the rest of the model should help take whatever's out there and craft it into something that's actually useful. So by the time you get to plan review and you're asking management, like, hey, this is the plan we have put together. It's going to take us this much time. We have this much resources. Here's our tool set. Here's what we can and can't do. You know, really, uh, as a nod to the rigor paper, Here's the TCPs we're going to be able to look for. Here's what we can't in our current state, and then you know, kind of go back and forth from there. And ultimately, that's going to that should better drive your, uh, you know, the, the management side to say, here's what we need resources into. This is um, you know, the value prop of looking for zero time activity and you know for follow-on activity, building a real program that actually makes sense there. So having a better feedback loop from the analysts all the way back up to the top is really kicked off by having some of that. Yeah, you know, that activity group come into play and have new capabilities there. So one one piece that I think um I was hoping we have time for, and I think even if we go a couple of minutes over on this webcast, it's gonna be worth it. But um one of the things I was hoping to cover, so for those who have the um the full uh web web uh go to meeting up, the link for this paper has been sent out. And if you go to a section in this paper, um the threat hunt model applied, it's really a walkthrough of a case study. Um, an example case study of uh, kind of notionally where these six steps of this six-step model exist. Um, it's uh, it's brief. It's probably less than a page. But Dan or Mark, are either one of you kind of comfortable with taking uh, maybe a minute on each section and just summarizing what what steps are happening in this notional use case at each of these six steps? I think that'll help from an audience and participation um, understanding level of just how does this applied. So uh, if if you go to the threat hunt model applied component of the paper and just walk through these six steps, um, I think that'd be a good use of our time here if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so starting with purpose, I mean, uh, purpose is again, where I said, um, you know, we don't recommend starting jumping directly into hypotheses because um, a lot of times the way that people build hypotheses, they, uh, constrain themselves from the start. So purpose really starts with, um, you know, threat hunting, you know, it requires human resources. Sometimes it requires outside contracts we see with people. It's resource intensive. And so purpose at the end of the day is the why, right? Why are you setting out to do this? Um, and from that why, you then get into the scope, which is the next step, which is, okay, um, for that and uh, I'm scrolling down to it. Um, your scope is then, okay, where are you going to look? And your scope, you start to take that purpose of why and you start to say, okay, it's going to be this one plant or it's going to be these plants or it's going to be this part of 
um, the network that we know um, was attacked first. So in the example of the paper, we talked about a crash override attack, what happened in Ukraine um, and what they did with IEC 104. And so in this example, you're talking uh, about, okay, you know, the purpose of my hunt might be, I wanna go look for Electrum for similar tactics to what happened in Ukraine um, in my power generation site. And I'm going to look at things similar to what was happening with IC 104. Um, we've done research and also looked at uh, doing the same IC 104 attack in DNP3 um, and found similar things with DNP3. So, you know, you're not necessarily safe just because the attack happened in IAC 104 in another place. Um, and so when we're hunting and when we're scoping, we'll look for that too. Hey, you know, it wasn't IAC 104 there. Here's how you do it, DNP3, and here's how you look. Um, but scoping gets down to saying, these are the systems. This is the part of the network that I'm going to test. From there, you then generate the hypotheses. So if you're in IAC 104, DNP3, whichever, you begin to ask questions like, hey, I'm going to abuse this portion of DNP3 or I think an attacker might abuse that. You can build a threat hunt around that protocol, knowing how that protocol works um, and the hypotheses associated with that. The next step is then equip. And so you have those hypotheses statements. Um, we talk a lot about the, uh, um, the cognitive bias of uh, Maslow's hammer. And so Maslow's hammer is basically when all you have is a hammer, everything seems to look like a nail. The reason equip is the third step and scope is number two is you shouldn't really think about tools when you're thinking about what you're looking at during a threat hunt. You should be saying, these are the questions I'm trying to answer going back to that purpose. And so equip is when you start to get into, these are the tools I need, whether it be something commercial, open source, or even if you have a threat hunting contract or you work with um, an outside group, bringing in that outside group. Um, from that stage, plan review is really just making sure that it meets the purpose. Um, funny, quick story too. Mark and I, over the last year, teach or over the last uh, year, year and a half, teaching this. Um, we actually were teaching um, a group who mentioned that uh, at an asset owner, someone got fired over um, a part of a threat hunt plan that wasn't entirely legal inside of the company, and it ended up someone being canned. So. Plan review can even get into the legality depending on what data you're trying to collect and process. And especially when you get into the SIP environment, um, you know, with third parties, when you're getting into SIP medium and SIP high data and, you know, all the protections around that. Um, so in this case, um, then executes actually doing it. And then finally, the last step that we saw important with this was that feedback step. So again, going back and saying whether it's IEC 104 and DNP3, um, for step one and five, all the way from purpose to execute, you know, what worked well, where do we need resources? How do we do this better? And, you know, how do we get more mature? So I think yeah. that's very, I think that's very helpful. And as, as people read through this, it's, uh, you, you can, you can pick up this paper and go straight to the section on threat hunt model applied. And if you start reading from there and you walk through these six elements, and then you think about what that means and how it applies to you and your organization and say, um, where do we need, if we wanted to be able to receive an indicator of compromise saying, hey, the uh, natural gas and pipeline sector is being targeted and they're being targeted by this adversary group with these uh, TTPs, do we have the capability to actually look um, in the right places for that adversary group with those TTPs? Um, can we consume those indicators? Can we act on it um, and kind of look across the six step to see uh, where your capabilities align and where they align with various adversary groups that are um, targeting your sector, your industry. Oftentimes a, uh, a company will come forward and talk about their capabilities and, and present them in a way of, we have this level of visibility, we have this level of network access control, we're doing this for uh, antivirus, we're doing this for IDS and IPS. And a simple question of, you know, kind of showing the Purdue model and saying, can you check the boxes for each one of those and say where you have them? And in almost all cases, they're all at the top. They're all on level five. They're all at the corporate business enterprise network. And as you start looking at different capabilities within an organization and saying, can you check any of those boxes in level three? 
um, for example? And do you have those capabilities down in that segment? And if the answer is no, then picking up something like this case study and saying, hey, we're going to go look for Electrum, and they're in control networks, and they're using 101 and 104, if you're looking for that in your IT environments, you're not going to find it, and you're going to come to the conclusion that, therefore, we have no Electrum uh, activity in our, in our network. So walking through this uh, applied case study will definitely shine some light on a few things, plus a comment that uh, Dan had mentioned, that just because you don't have any 104 or 101 activity or uh, IEC 61850 activity in your network, that doesn't mean that adversary group isn't there. It means they use those specific protocols for a target. Um, if they were targeting you, they would likely be looking towards what you're using, which may be DNP3 or OPC or Profinet or something different. So you'd be looking for the broader uh, indicators from that adversary group, not just what they've demonstrated at a different target in each case. Um, I, I think picking up that applied case study and looking at these six steps and thinking about where you are from a capability and maturity model will help. Um, Mark and Dan, I think uh, with the time we have remaining, I'm going to go through a couple of lightning round questions to close out this section, and then we'll go to the third and final. Um, one, if you can just give us your thoughts on uh, confidence in naming an adversary, meaning with uh, reports um, occurring for some campaigns in the last year or two of one adversary nation state stealing tool sets from another and masquerading their attacks to make it look like it's coming from another. Um, as you're looking to those TTPs and you're, you're kind of trying to identify who it is with uh, adversary groups actively trying to masquerade each other, um, what other things that you can uh, safely mention would you say uh, when we go to your adversary baseball cards that were mentioned before and you're kind of identifying activity groups, what level of confidence do you have in, in the, the legitimacy behind those activity groups, knowing that they're trying to, uh, in some cases, masquerade? Yeah, so I, I think I think the way that uh, that we approach that is is less about thinking about the naming conventions and thinking about the, the attribution and where everything is at behind the scenes and more about what are the unique TTPs that are going on here? Um, ultimately, we are trying to we're, we're trying to hunt, we're trying to valid, validate in data whether something is abnormal, right? And abnormal contains all of those all of those uh, those behaviors, the indicators. It, it, it's everything that anyone who's not supposed to be inside of critical infrastructure, anything that they're doing is what we need to look for. So, kind of applying that to the activity groups to say. Well, the naming conventions really don't excite me that much. But the TTPs that I'm looking for, that's when we're that's when we build up our own repo of what are things that we could that we typically look for. What are the new things that are coming in? So even if even if activity groups are are, are swapping around tools or they're borrowing things or they're you know still using Mimicats because that works, um, just to be able to look at those and go, okay, well the activity group is what it is. But do I have coverage of that, right? So going back to the rigor paper of, yes, do I have coverage of these things? Am, am I at least getting all the TTPs or at least trying trying to push that forward? So uh, confidence in inside of are they swapping around tools or, or are the activity groups themselves? Not as interested in that. Focusing more on what can I actually go prove in data um, because I'm not going to find a xenotime string inside of, uh, inside of malware or inside of the raw traffic. Or at least I hope not. Um, it, it really focus more on what's actually happening. Sure. Um, so, Dan, next uh, lightning round question, and it's something that I imagine uh, just looking at the people on this on this call, probably 80% of the folks would love to hear even a notional number here. Um, every utility, every asset owner and operator, everybody in critical infrastructure, when they're looking for additional full-time equivalent resources, they're looking for additional O&M. Um, capital is generally uh, easier to obtain, but additional O&M is the holy grail and very difficult to acquire. Um, the general question they will ask when they're asking for something is um, everybody's looking for benchmarking. They're saying, what, what is a company of our size? What, what do they have? What does their threat hunting program look like? What is their staff levels? What is their uh, operating budget? What is their capital budgets? Um, do you have any number notional that you could say, we'll, we'll pick a uh, a mid-sized utility. That way, uh, anybody else on the phone who's a large uh, multinational or a large um, utility in multi-state or small municipalities, co-ops, um, they could 
adjust the number up or down. For a mid-size utility with a capable threat hunting program, um, number of people um, to start with, and then uh, resources availability. Um, to what level do they rely on outsourcing or managed services versus uh, handling it all in-house? So, so it doesn't take that many people. Um, and so, you know, funny enough, so I was the second. Um, the Dragos talk two years ago was just Ben and I. So we were threat hunting with, uh, you know, a, a talk of a size of two servicing. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't take many people to do it if you have um, the right skill sets, right, which is kind of a magic uh, in quotes word to say there. Um, a lot of what we see when we're working with, um, you know, even large uh, large companies, medium to large companies, is the number right now that we deal with is generally under half a dozen people. Um, and to the point of tools, again, it's going to go into the background of those people. I mean, do they know how to use, you know, if you don't have the O&M budget for tools, right, you're looking at using open source stuff. So are you familiar with um you know, either the SANS toolkit that's pushed out through SANS training, are you familiar with Network Miner, with Elk, some of the other things that, you know, you're going to be rolling yourself if you have less of a budget. Um, you know, when we did the S4 detection challenge, right, um, a year ago at S4, which is a industry conference um, um, in Miami, um, you know, it was teams of two people, and uh, there was a Dragos team going against a Kaspersky team going against uh, two people from asset owners. And, um, you know, some of their findings, um, you know, we found a lot of the same stuff. That being said, we, Kaspersky, obviously, um, Dragos and Kaspersky found a little more because we have more streamlined toolkits. Um, but it doesn't take many people if you have the right people. But again, it's getting, uh, you know, the right talent, the few right talent that knows how to use uh, um, either open source or closed source tools. Awesome. Hey, Carol, I'm going to ask oh, for uh, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness and say we're probably going to go five minutes over. But um, let no me problem. let me pause here and kind of move on to this this third um, kind of a joke and a non paper meaning. I believe this this last half of this talk as we've been preparing for this uh, webcast with Dan and Mark and talking about where we thought we could help the most. Um, I believe kind of the closing component here is this people process and technology that's necessary for an effective threat hunting program. I think that paper needs to be written. So more of a, a scientific paper has already been written with a, with a call for something better and better rigor and common language and common understanding. A paper has been written on doing threat hunting from an applied perspective. And I think this piece could really be more of a practitioner focused, what types of open source tools, what does good look like, um, more of a benchmarking side, and truly trying to, the way we started this conversation, that everybody's not at the same place, everybody's not at the same capability and maturity level, um, and nor does every organization need to be. So this, this discussion along the lines of what types of uh, tools, what types of approaches um, should exist and should organizations pursue, um, as I've thought about this for some time, uh, in classes that we teach, people are always asking, "Do we? Hey, should we should we be looking at uh, specific for our OT environments? Should we be looking at network whitelisting and benchmarking of traffic and understanding what normal is? Should we be looking to behavior analytics? Should we be looking to anomaly detection? Should we be looking to a hybrid resource of all those things?" And over time, the way I've talked about it, and I've kind of just uh, for the purpose of this discussion built this this uh, in my mind the way I've been thinking about it from. On the left side, you kind of have the maturity indicator level of an organization, which includes kind of funding, team size, uh, situational awareness, meaning are they getting threat intel feeds? Are they operating in this space? What's their level of knowledge and capability? And what do their business objectives require? Um, and then on the bottom is kind of the technical, what, what capabilities do you have within your OT environments to actually see data? Um, is it from host only? Is it from, uh, you know, point in time network taps? Do you have the ability to do limited network span ports on some of your industrial switches if they're managed and if the vendor allows it? Do you have a full backplane capability of capture, real time network collection? Can you aggregate those uh, pieces together? Do you have an integrated SOC? And ultimately, what you're discovering and operating in, are you feeding that back into operations and helping them 
make operational decisions if you're seeing odd, questionable traffic within the OT environment. Um, based on that and kind of where those all sort of apply, I took the three common questions that we get from a network whitelisting to a behavior analytic to anomaly detection, and I placed them on this graph. Um, I hope uh, we can take this and drive it into a paper with Dan and Mark and, and Dragos and get some industry feedback and uh, likely create some cool graphics that we can make a poster with. But I think this, this third topic is an area that um, needs further investigation and further discussion so people can vet it out and say, you know, this kind of makes sense and aligns to us. But um, along these lines with the two gentlemen on the phone, if uh, either looking to this and your feedback on it or just what you've seen, some examples of in the field, what does good look like? Have you been into an organization where you've seen, hey, the things that you guys are doing, um, you don't need our help. You're, you're way beyond, uh, you know, where most organizations are um, from a staffing, from a training, from a tool, technology. And then on the other end, meaning you get into an organization and you're talking to them about where they start. So open source tools that you would point them to, um, just any feedback that you could provide on, on the range of different organizations and where they land. And, um, you know, kind of any company meeting them where they are, what's, what's the next step that they should pursue, either through technology or through courses or open source, any of the above. Um, we're kind of at time for the webcast. For those who need to leave, I uh, appreciate you joining us, but we will stay on for a few more minutes as, as Mark and Dan discuss this uh, final component. Yeah, so certainly on this, I mean, one of the one of the fun parts actually being on the vendor side, right, is we get to see a very wide range of programs um, and we get to be involved, um, you know, a part of their programs, um, you know, as they kind of do reach those higher maturity levels. Um, we certainly have uh, some asset owners that are have really solid programs, that, but we've still found ways to um, kind of keep the security bar going forward. And then we've had, uh, um, you know, the extreme, extreme resource con constrained programs where, um, you know, security is a one person shop and it's a shared duty with someone else. Or, um, you know, they were the person at the plant that knew the most about computers. And so they ended up being the security person. Uh, definitely seen that places too. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting paper um, you know, as we as as it does get defined out to your point um, and earlier on the resourcing for tools, because um, where you're going to start right is you can start with tactics. And again, going back to the um, Sands and the Dragos papers on Ukraine, you can start with those tactics and you can do it with open source tools. Um, the other component of maturity, though, and really where you enter a difficult part of the industrial problem with this is when you start getting into super proprietary protocols that a lot of the uh you know ics manufacturers they might not have it documented um and so you need tools for very exotic environments right for exotic protocols that um aren't well understood and that's where particularly as you get up maturity right you're getting into more of those industrial protocols which are driving the process on the network so um I think that's another interesting thing to bring up to with um, capabilities and maturity, particularly with industrial, um, just with how, you know, how plants are constructed and how the networks work. Okay, look, look, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add on top of that. Uh, again, I echo a lot of Dan's sentiments there, but, you know, having been out to, to numerous sites at this point over over two, two years here, uh, a lot of times when we're coming to facilities, just asking for documentation about what what inventories do you have of, of assets, right? How does the how does the process actually work, right? Where, where are the critical points and how how do things move in and out? Um, what does the network diagram look like? A lot of those places, a lot of the facilities that we go to have either things that are very much out of date or things that don't exist at all. Um, and and trying to get get uh, you know a span port set up for the first time, um, you know, on, on gear that hopefully they can actually do that. To just start getting a lay of the land. I mean, I think that's I think that's one of the biggest things. Going back to the the environmental hunting side of, let's just get that that high level picture of what's going on. Uh, sure, we uh, we've had a number of times where where folks say, yep, our firewall config is blocking all these things, and we end up doing a network review, and and we find that there are a lot of patterns around the firewall. Um, you know, just doing whatever. There's there's that awesome awesome any any rule just in the top of a beautiful rule set. 
uh, that's just not doing anything. So being able to just just to go in and say like, yep, we're going to start collecting data to build a collection management framework just to start there. Uh, and, and certainly there have been companies that have been able to go beyond that, and that gets to Dan's point about they're into some super proprietary stuff. They need to they need some other other things to dig deeper. But for the majority of, uh, of the industry that we've seen, it's kind of their first time just grabbing some of that data or grabbing it in the in a different way to kind of uh, get an operational picture. Um, yeah, so yeah, I just added that on the end. I think you summarized some of the greatest challenges that appear in most environments is just, number one, uh, understanding the environment and the data flows so you can determine what's most important, and then getting visibility into that environment as um, many environments do not have managed switches. And then from uh, an operational reliability and safety perspective, if you have managed switches working with the vendors to determine what's the backplane impact that would allow you to actually port span or mirror you may be limited to capturing one or two interfaces only in some spaces. So the the understanding the network flows and understanding operations so you could determine what's most important, then getting visibility to that data set, and then ultimately being able to do acquisition and response. Um, you know, so coming in and saying, we're going to go purchase this anomaly detection tool without first understanding the environment or ensuring that you have visibility, um, you may be spending a bunch of capital dollars on something that you can't actually implement. So um, for sure, those are the greatest challenges that uh, many cases, understanding operations and then, uh, you know, enabling the ability to use some of these tools and capabilities, sort of uh, the bottom line of this of this graph of, of whether you only have the ability to do host detection, or if you can move more to the right to be able to do full capture and then real-time network collection. And um, that's where some of these other tools and capabilities become more interesting and valuable. Um, on the uh, on the one piece that I think I would like to mention, so there's an, uh, tool sets that uh, and platforms that uh, you provide. Do you see people uh, leveraging those up the stack, meaning into level five of the Purdue model, into their IT environments as well, or do you see them traditionally putting your sensors and site stores kind of down in the OT environment? and only leveraging the IT enterprise networks for um, communication paths? Or do you see sensors going into the IT environments as well, looking for TTP indicators and um, driving playbook actions? We've seen, uh, so we've seen some really flat networks, um, like flatter networks sometimes than people thought they were. Um, and so, so certainly we've seen that traffic up there. Um, and I think to your point, um, you know, when you're talking about um, particularly correlating attacks and TTPs, right, you do want to be a little closer to where spear phishing happens sometimes, right? And when you're talking on threat behavior analytics, right, you want to be able to see those indicators of spear phishing and some of the things that happen on the IT side. So, you know, it's certainly an area that, um, you know, any security, any comprehensive security program should kind of, you um, Exactly to your point, you know, have coverage, um, you know, and sensors all the way up there. Um, we've mostly seen it on, uh, you know, flatter networks or places, as Mark said, where um, the drop isn't what they thought it was. Yeah, I, right. think it, I think at this point, I mean, from the, from the deployments, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, certainly bread and butter folks on the OT network. Right, look at those communications in and out, um, and again, providing a lot of rich context alerts on those. But from the other side of having a flat network, most of the time it's a discovery of, oh, wow, you're, you're giving us a lot of IT traffic as well, um, which, again, uh, it's a dance point, a lot of correlation there. But we have all range of deployments at this point of, of any combination of that, because uh, really those, those networks are, are, are working together. There's a lot of, a lot of business uh, pieces that need to tie into the control system. Um, that, that we're seeing. So we would have want to view those pivots as much as we can. One piece that I'll throw out, just uh, this is the first time I've I've kind of put this on paper and shown this out um, and already through some feedback through uh, some of the attendees. Over to the left is the value of, of uh, Intel feeds. And e even if you can't get anything from your own environment, getting things from other people's environments. So Intel feeds, information sharing and analysis centers, uh, state fusion centers, for rely on companies that have some of these capabilities and they've moved over to the right. Um, they're seeing uh, adversary activity and they're sharing it and reporting it. Um, even if you don't have any of these capabilities, even if you don't have host only, there is still some place to start. 
um, by uh, t consuming those uh, Intel feeds from other sources. Um, again, some were mentioned earlier, but uh, for sure rely on ISACs and rely on uh, fusion centers and other other sources of data. So uh, I will expand this chart one more column to the left to show uh, to show non-organic um, data sources from your own environment, but relying on others as well. Um, with that, I, uh, I thank all of those on the call. It's been been a great webcast. Um, Dan and Mark uh, appreciate everything. The points of contact are listed here. And um, Carol, I think that uh, that wraps up everything we have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Tim, Mark, and Dan, for your great presentation. And to Dragos for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.